I have written a very large book on strategy, uh, which uh, is actually not that expensive given the size. Uh, <laughs> um, quite cheap on Amazon. Um, uh, and it does indeed look at sort of military strategy, political strategy, business strategy, all sorts of strategy. Um, and certain themes come through the book. I'll, I'll say a little bit uh, about those themes. I also will we'll try and sort of apply it a bit to some contemporary events, um, perhaps not to, not to spread myself too thinly, look uh, at Ukraine the, uh, and Russia at the moment, because it, it actually seems to be a very interesting illustration of the problems of strategy. Uh, one of the reasons um, I wrote the book, apart from that, it's a topic that's always interested me, um, is you get not only uh, very, uh, the proliferation of the use of the word, there's strategies for everything now, uh, so that everybody has to have a strategy, but the belief that somehow it's a magic ingredient that if policymakers are missing, uh, then they're going to be less coherent and less competent than if they have got a strategy. And there's constant demands on governments to have one and constant lamentations that they don't. Uh, and often it's the opposition parties that are demanding strategies um, because if you say you need a strategy, you're not saying you should be doing this, you're saying you should be thinking more about what to do and that gets us off the hook of having our own ideas about what to do. So everybody demands of government strategies and they find it very difficult to deliver them. Now, I think, to explain why I think they find it difficult, let me just say a few words about why I think strategy in general is difficult. Um, I think it's important, but I do think it's difficult. The first point to make is that people tend to think of strategy as a plan, uh, as a sequence of moves that gets you to a very defined objective. Uh, and often when people are saying we need a strategy, the first place they'll start is by saying, well, what are you trying to achieve? What's your objective? And then when we've agreed that, we'll work backwards. But actually, strategy doesn't work very well like that. Um, and the reason is very simple. If you're dealing with other willful human beings rather than inanimate objects, um, then it's actually quite difficult to have a plan because the individuals you're dealing with have got their own plans, their own ideas, their own strategies. Um, and therefore, uh, the sequence of events that you've set out to get you to your finishing point don't necessarily um, get you where you want to because uh, you suddenly find that they've been cleverer than you are or uh, they've got more resources than you are and you're not at the place that you wanted to be. I mean, the most famous quote on this is, is von Moltke's, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Um, in, in my book, I start with a, a pithier version by Mike Tyson. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, 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 it's the same basic idea. Um, so the idea of strategy as a plan uh, is, is problematic because, in practice, um, you rarely can follow a sequence of moves unless you're very powerful or very lucky. Secondly, I'm not convinced anyway that it's about setting clear objectives. Obviously, you've got to have a sense of what you're trying to achieve and where you would like to get to. Um, but once you've got to where you'd like to get to, you still need strategy. It isn't over. Um, you win an election, you've got to govern. You, you win a battle, you've got to occupy. Uh, you have a takeover that's successful, uh, you've got to merge two companies. Uh, so strategy always seems to me anyway to be more like a, a soap opera than a three-act play. It, it, it's one thing after the other, it never stops. So, the, um, so I prefer to see strategy uh, as being about how you solve the problems of the here and now. Uh, and that's in practice how a lot of it happens. It may be that as you take on a particular, quite specific issue, very large questions about the future are raised. You talk about uh, what to do about Ukraine, but it's raising questions all the time about uh, 
uh, the, Russia's role in, in Europe, where's Russia's going, how it links with China. I mean, there's very big questions raised once you start dealing with a very specific problem. So it's not arguing for sort of uh, myopia, for a narrow view. It's just accepting that actually practical politics starts with the here and now. Um, and a lot of it is about getting to the next stage when you, you, you will have to reappraise. So the approach to strategy I argue for is one of flexibility, adaptability, and it's an ability to see within situations the, the developing possibilities. The sort of strategic genius is, is, an, is an ability to see what is possible in circumstances where other people can't see it. Uh, and in that sense, you have to recognize two, th two other things about strategy. First, um, we like to think about it as the end of a long process of deliberation. Uh, well, that's fine if you have a long time to deliberate. But as often as not, in, in a crisis or a fast-moving situation, you don't. You thought you had a view about how the world was, and all of a sudden you find the world isn't like that. Uh, and you have to form a judgment quite quickly about what to do and how to respond. And these judgments are critical. And one of the things I do in the book is, is look, uh, as many people do these days, at, at sort of cognitive psychology and the way it affects behavioral economics. I think it's just Daniel Kahneman and all that is very interesting in terms of uh, the importance of intuitive responses to events uh, and why these are often... As, as valid and as effective as the more deliberative um, apparent analysing of all possibilities and so on. Uh, I think one of the best essays that uh, Isaiah Berlin wrote just not long before he died was on political judgment, which is essentially this quality that, that can be developed um, uh, over time and experience of even subconsciously analysing a situation, seeing the possibilities and knowing quite apparently instinctively which way to go. Then, of course, you may do the deliberative stuff. Often the deliberative stuff rationalises intuition. Another reason why strategy uh, is often like that has, uh, is because you're not taking the initiative. A lot of you know, books about strategy assume you're the one who's going... Um, uh, to launch the new initiative. Uh, often you're responding to somebody else's initiative and you may be in a very defensive mode. Uh, much strategy is exactly of that nature. The first task is, is to survive, uh, is to cope, and only then, after that, can you uh, start to think about imposing your will, uh, getting some control of the situation. So for all these reasons, I think strate strategic thinking is extremely important but it's also very difficult. It's very difficult for Western countries, in addition, um, because, by and large, we're about the status quo. Now, we can th all think of examples recently where attempts have been made to change the status quo by Western countries. And that, to some extent, reflects the nature of the world uh, after the end of the Cold War. <coughs> But you know, by and large, um, what we really want is open political and economic systems, trading, uh, and so on. And we don't see ourselves as the one, uh, as, as the countries that are interested uh, in changing borders by force, and so on. Um, now, if you're a status quo power, um, strategy actually, in principle, is pretty boring um, and, and not very difficult because your basic objective is that nothing should happen. Um, nothing's happened today, the strategy's succeeding. Um, you, you, you're not after trying to change a lot. And I think this is one of the reasons why um, governments told that they need a, a new grand strategy uh, of, often seem to, to lack one, because what is it, what's the problem they're trying to solve in the grand strategy? What is it that, that's failing? Often what you're bothered about is other countries, let's say Russia, let's say China, um, coming up with, with much more radical ideas about how the international system should be organised um, and, and challenging the status quo. That's what you're worried about. 
but they may not be doing it at the moment, and the circumstances in which they may do it in the future can be hard to imagine. So often when governments have to come up with these grand strategies, um, the results are, are an inevitably a disappointment. And anybody uh, within government, or indeed with any organisation, whether it's a corporation or even a university, where I had to do it, um, will know uh, just how difficult it is to produce these documents. Uh, because I'm mean, just give you an example from a university. You, um, you know, in the UK, we've got this issue about student fees, which is a new uh, came in a few years ago. Quite major changes, so we have to come up with a strategy for how we deal with it. We, there's a genuine problem to be solved, and we come up with some ideas, and they're quite bold. <clears throat> and so uh, you start to write these bold ideas down, and then uh, the, 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 the person who's dealing with apparently marginal aspect of this strategy worries that, that her particular area is not being given enough prominence in this statement of, of, of where we're going. So, yeah, all right, we'll, we'll put that in. And then somebody points out that, yeah, but when you present this to all the university departments, think about how they're going to read that sentence. Oh, yeah, we better, we better uh, calm that sentence down, mitigate the effects a little bit. And so, yeah, but it's going to appear in The Guardian tomorrow anyway. Uh, so, um, so by the time the document is produced, it's, a, it's bland, uh, totally uninteresting, uh, and very safe. Meanwhile, you've still got your strategy in, in your heads and you're trying to make the decisions, but you've probably failed completely in explaining uh, or, or capturing anybody's interest. Or one particular word will come through, uh, sentence will come through that the uh, cognoscenti will realise is actually what it's all about. So the half-lives of these documents are really very short. Um, so all that, these are all reasons why um, I think strategy is difficult and why we shouldn't be so surprised was when we, people keep on demanding of governments that they produce better strategies and the results are so disappointing. To show what I mean, uh, I'll, I'll take the, just also to give us uh, something to talk about uh, in, in, in the Q&A, just to take the example of, of Ukraine, which I, I, I've been following pretty closely, um, and in particular, um, Putin, because one of, the, one of the features of a lot of commentary, a bit less now than, than there was uh, a couple of months ago, is Putin, Putin's a sort of strategic genius. Uh, he's bold, he's decisive, he makes moves, and everybody else is left flat-footed. Uh, they're, they're constantly uh, trying to catch up uh, and what they produce in response to this bold and decisive move uh, is, is weak and feeble, uh, some piddling economic sanctions that they can brush away. Yet, if you actually look at what's happened, um, you'd be hard put to say that this has been a resounding success for Putin. Um, and why is that? Because I don't think, in practice, he was um, he, he, he was doing what most people do when, when they form strategies under pressure, which is they were making certain assumptions about the people with whom they were dealing and how they would respond. And some of these he gets right and some of these he gets wrong. So very briefly, um, my interpretation of what's been going on, which is uh, not necessarily be others, is that Putin has long been irritated with, with NATO and the West and the EU, um, believes that uh, promises that were made, which you know, there are questions about exactly how much these promises were made, but believes that promises that were made in the 90s, early 90s were not kept, um, that it's expanded more than should have been done, and that he'd seen this idea of a Eurasian Union as a, as a proper response, which brings certainly Belarus and, and Kazakhstan into the story, but was also intended to bring Armenia and Moldova and Ukraine in, into the picture, because then you're, you're almost starting not quite to reconstruct the old Soviet Union, but you're having a space, a Russian space, that, it, that goes beyond Russian borders, with which uh, gives them some sort of clout. And though I think generally most people think this idea of a Eurasian Union was always a little bit unrealistic, given the rather unpromising uh, countries 
with which you'd have to put it together. Uh, in Putin's rhetoric uh, from about 2011 on, uh, it, it, it became almost a counter to the European Union. And I think it's important to keep in mind that as I think to him it was far more important to counter the European Union than it was to counter NATO because the EU tended to, was going to be the advance guard uh, if Ukraine uh, and, and, uh, uh, and Moldova and so on did make a decisive turn to the West. And in the middle of last year, uh, real pressure was put well, first on Armenia, which sort of crumbled immediately, uh, then on Moldova and on Ukraine. Uh, Moldova held out, uh, Ukraine changed its mind, this is before the Vilnius uh, summit of the European Partnership of the European Union, um, changed its mind about moving to an association agreement with the EU and instead moved um, in Russia's direction under Yanukovych uh, and critically accepted a $15 billion loan and generous terms and generous terms on energy. And it's probably the case um, that uh, Yanukovych didn't have very many options at that time. I don't think because there's no way the EU would have offered that sort of money because it would have been irresponsible to do so. Uh, either you have to reform the country, which Yanukovych didn't want to do, or uh, and, and address issues of corruption and subsidies and so on, or you, you went to the Russians. This produced a reaction, as we know, um, and by the end of February, Yanukovych had fled, uh, and Putin was faced with a real problem, um, that the, uh, the policy he had followed, which was not cheap, to draw Ukraine into the Russian sphere had failed. It had been rejected decisively, uh, at least on the western part of Ukraine, and so he had to do something. That was the problem he was trying to solve. I don't think this was you know, a long uh, plotted idea of seizing Crimea. The problem was uh, how, what do we do about Ukraine? And I think the decision he took, um, which uh, was bold, um, was to destabilize Ukraine. And you have, this is why it's necessary to look quite closely at the particular, almost day by day, because if you recall when the crisis broke, there was as much activity in eastern Ukraine as there was in Crimea. Um, and my view, and, and also that, that, that Putin was saying initially he had no interest in taking Crimea, in, in, in annexing Crimea. I think what happened was that the first move failed um, because actually it was only in Crimea that uh, the Russians had a pretty obvious foothold because of the Sevastopol base, uh, but it never really consolidated elsewhere. Um, so the next stage was to take Crimea. Um, and then the stage after that um, was to try to revive the pressure in eastern Ukraine, because otherwise he'd lost Crimea. He gained Crimea, but lost the rest of Ukraine. And the original aim was to have Ukraine looking eastward rather than westward. Um, now, we can go through day by day on that, but it doesn't seem to me that's worked. Um, and now he's created a problem for us, uh, for Ukraine, for himself, in um, encouraging the separatists uh, in one you know, big, important bit of eastern Ukraine, not all of eastern Ukraine, um, to establish... Uh, well-defended uh, redoubts, but they're not really in control of the area. There's no evidence of mass political support for these groups. Uh, there's evidence of some sympathy for more autonomy, rights of Russian speakers, and so on. But, but there's a problem there. Now, you know, and I'm not sure how this will end up, although I think now that Poroshenko is that one can at least see the basis of, a, of an, on, an outline political settlement, but it'll be very difficult to tidy up the situation in, in eastern Ukraine. Now, as this happened, you see um, something that I find quite interesting generally in these sorts of cases, which is the, the pressure put by uh, 
the West on Russia in itself doesn't amount to very much. But the consequences of that are much more profound because what you've seen within Russia itself is an increasing reluctance by foreigners to invest, um, uh, already uh, declining projections for GDP going down even further, an enormous capital flight. I mean, lots and lots of money is leaving. To, to, uh, and to see, you get reports now of Putin putting pressure on his favorite oligarchs to keep their money in Russia. Um, and, uh, plus, of course, NATO and the EU and the US are looking at energy supplies, uh, energy security, and so on. Over time, that will affect Gazprom's position in Europe. Putin, therefore, tries to do something with the Chinese. The Chinese, who are, are no fools on these issues, uh, get a very good deal. Um, and it doesn't make a lot of difference in the short term anyway. So um, all this is to say, I don't think it's been, uh, Putin has been strategically brilliant. Uh, he's acted decisively, but hasn't necessarily got him to the place he wanted to go. To conclude, I mean, I want to just use that example to just to underline some of the points I was making uh, before. I don't think Putin had a plan. I don't think when he made his first move, he was clear what his second move or third move or fourth move was going to be. I think he had assumptions that the people in eastern Ukraine were probably far more pro-Russian than it turned out to be the case. Um, and if there had been, then maybe he would have had more options than he thought. But it's a good example of trying to solve a particular problem by taking a move and then finding yourself in a different place to the one you had you expected to be, and therefore having to take another move, which probably takes you even further away from the place that you wanted to be and expected to be. And that the unintended consequences of these actions are really very important. Uh, that that uh, you think you're taking, uh, you, you have an idea of what you're going to achieve, uh, what you might achieve, but other things go on in consequence that you don't quite anticipate. And I think, again, more, always one of the salutary lessons about military strategy or international politics in general is unintended consequences. They're often as important, if not more so, than the consequences that are intended, even if you, if you reach them. Uh, so I think uh, and th there are obviously other things we can talk about on this particular case or on strategy generally. My basic argument is it's very difficult. Um, just because somebody's being bold doesn't mean to say they've got it right. And that, the, um, and that there is a need um, to think strategically. But if you are thinking strategically, don't think too far ahead, but do think about the consequences of unintended as well as intended of the actions that you wish to take. Thank you very much.